After a four-decade reign, Cambodia's Prime Minister hands power to his son. Following years of brutal war and genocide, Hun Sen is credited with restoring stability post-Khmer Rouge. But he stifled democracy in the process. With power now set to be handed to his son, will anything change? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Cambodia. Well, just days after the Cambodian People's Party won 120 out of 125 parliamentary seats in a general election, leader Hun Sen announced his eldest son would be taking over the top job. Western-educated Hun Manet is a four-star general and had been earmarked for the position since 2021. Manet has said little about his vision for the country, but according to his father, he will still have to toe the line. Hun Sen won't be disappearing into retirement, he is staying on as head of the ruling party and a member of the National Assembly. He also recently said he would step back into the prime minister's job if his son did not perform well. I now say to you that Hun Mane will become the prime minister from the evening of August 22nd, 2023. Then you can call him the prime minister or you can be outlawed if you don't call him the prime minister. To all brothers and sisters who are ministers, please stay calm. We must have one sacrifice, and the biggest sacrifice is me, even though my son takes my job. But the person who used to be in command had power, and now I have no power. So this is the sacrifice. Well, there was no doubt the party would win the election and the reins would be handed over. The only opposition party that could have posed a threat was barred from running after being accused of not submitting the right paperwork. Now, there was also a crackdown on opposition voices ahead of the vote, which meant spoiling ballots was one of the only remaining outlets for people to protest the regime. But now, Hun Sen says those who spoiled their ballots should come forward or face legal consequences. Opposition politicians, most of them in self-exile and rights groups, say Hun Sen has for years suppressed democratic institutions. They say party colleagues and relatives have benefited from a range of business concessions, claims the government denies. Quite clearly, there's a, an, an effort by Hun Sen to intimidate everyone he can to enforce uh, a degree of silence uh, from both the people and from the opposition political parties to try to make it look like there's democracy. The change will come when the Cambodian people will rise up and the army, the army will seize this opportunity to stop supporting the dictator and uh, to stand with the people. This is how things have changed, how dictatorships have been uh, abolished. Many people, though, were happy about the result of the election. They see Hun Sen as the man who brought peace to the country after a devastating civil war in the 1970s. But the new leader may not be able to continue that narrative for much longer. He will have to address other pressing issues facing the country, including income inequality. Although the country had one of the fastest growing economies in the world up until 2018, it has not been equally distributed, and many people are struggling to make ends meet. And there is an expectation by the younger generation that the government will become more liberal, especially with the new leader being educated in the West. But that could be a tall order within the current regime and with Hun Sen looking to cement his legacy. I think Prime Minister Hun Sen is beginning to look to his legacy. Hun Sen claims to be Cambodia's great peacemaker, that he took part in the overthrow of the murderous Khmer Rouge regime in 1979. Hun Sen brought the Cambodian civil war to an end and reincorporated a lot of these former enemies into the political fold. Um, and so Hun Sen claims that he achieved what the UN, what foreign governments of various kinds could not, um, which was to bring peace and stability to the country. This is what Hun Sen's myth is built on. It's got an element of truth to it, but obviously his role in bringing Cambodia's civil war to an end has been exaggerated in certain respects. But I think that this legacy of economic development, stability and peace is really what Hun Sen is seeking to enshrine.
So if Hun Sen is working in the interest of his own legacy through appointing his son, could things improve for Cambodia? Or is this passing of the torch a further entrenchment of one-party rule? Well, joining me now to debate the future of the country are from Singapore. Che An Banarit. He is the president of Cambodia's Asian Vision Institute. From Rhode Island, Musu Koa. She is the former vice president of the Cambodian National Rescue Party and the former minister of women and veterans affairs in Hun Sen's coalition government. And from Washington, D.C. is Sopal Ear author of Aid Dependence in Cambodia and associate professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. Thanks all so much for being with us. So, Paul, I will start with you. You know, for those who don't follow Cambodia, the recent headline could have come as a shock because this is a country that holds elections, yet here we are with a father handing power to his oldest son, and no one is particularly surprised. So have Cambodians long understood that this would be a family dynasty of sorts? Well, it's always been discussed as such. I mean, in the sense of uh, suspicions or, or talk of the son being the prime candidate for succession um, by the father's choosing. But, um, but of course, for the first 20 years after the UN came and organized Cambodia's first election, uh, it was supposed to be a competitive democracy. There were real candidates, there were I mean, there were real parties running and a relatively freer and fairer and more credible competitive process. It's just that in 2017, 2018, things changed dramatically and we have not seen uh, real competition uh, allowed because the main opposition party was not allowed, was dissolved by order of the Supreme Court. And in this most recent 2023 election, uh, the main opposition uh, party, credible opposition mm. party, was not allowed to register. So why why even hold the elections? Is it simply to ensure that maybe they can prevent any new sanctions coming on? I think there's a veneer of legitimacy from the standpoint of um, appearing to hold a process uh, in which uh, uh, you know elections are supposedly uh, supposed to be. The, the culmination of a democratic process. Well, if you hold an election but have no democratic process, is it really, is it still a democracy? Or are we simply playing democracy or play acting democracy? Is this a kind of um, uh, virtue signaling where, hey, it looks like we have a competitive process, but in fact, we don't. Okay, let me turn to Cheyang Vanaritz because you're actually very optimistic about this move. So what do you make of Sopal's comments? Well, I, I think the power transition in Cambodia uh, is taking place in kind of, if you look at the historical spectrum, it's over 500 years that Cambodia has not had uh, any peaceful or smooth power transition uh, due to the lack of strong institutions. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the development of Cambodian politics is very much personalized. So personalized uh, political environment is very vulnerable to instability and chaos. So I think this is a, a critical turning point uh, in Cambodian history over the past uh, 50 years that we have such a relatively peaceful and smooth power transition. So uh, I think moving forward, um, the thing that they need to focus on to build institutions so once we have a strong institution, so future power transition uh, will be uh, better uh, in a sense that uh, it will be more uh, kind of uh, inclusive, uh, more participatory. Okay, let me ask uh, Musu Koa what you make of that. I mean, it's a, at the very least a peaceful transition of power. Is there some silver lining there? I totally disagree that it is a peaceful uh, transfer of power. First of all, we should not call it an election at all. It is surely, surely a political theater set up by Hun Sen for Hun Sen to put more strength into his um, politics, which is to strengthen his power, which is to transfer his power to his son, which is to further establish the um, dynasty of the Hun family. 
So we should never, ever even call it a election or a sham election. Therefore, if there is no such thing as free, fair election, people should not say it's a, a transfer, legitimate transfer of power. I totally disagree with the word transfer of power, whether or not it is blood, uh, it is peaceful or not. How okay. can it be for power when no one can speak? No one in Cambodia can speak. Therefore, the world should not play the new narrative of Hun Sen, which is to say that there is a transfer of power. They totally okay. disagree. And, and you don't only feel that this is all wrong, but that there should be consequences from the international community. I mean, that's an approach that's arguably been tried before, mainly via U.S. sanctions. It's, it really hasn't worked. So why could it work now? for the international community to take action? And, and how would they have to, to have an impact on what you feel is this tightening of power rather than any sort of peaceful transition? I think this is the very first time that immediately after this, uh, trans this um, political theater that the U.S. has made a very strong state, not just a strong statement, but action, which is targeted sanctions, visa sanctions, and suspension of aid, which is worth $18 million. But the U.S. alone doing it is not enough. It has to be a coordinated, a targeted efforts of the signatories of the Paris Peace Accord. Professor Yeso Paul said earlier, there was such a thing as a Paris Peace Accord, that 18 plus signatories, uh, including the major um, international community uh, players, signed up to. These are obligations that need to be further implemented to move Cambodia truly toward a free, fair elections to start with and toward the real peace that the people of Cambodia are hungry for. Mm. Let me ask Vanaritz uh, what you make of that suggestion. And I mean, and to note as well that many kind of foreign aid workers have really criticized uh, the international policy toward, uh, Western-led policy at least toward Cambodia, saying it's been quite dysfunctional. There are sanctions, but they still engage. It hasn't quite worked. So here we hear a call from the opposition to be more serious about sanctioning so that government leadership actually feels the effect. Do you think that would backfire? I think we need to understand politics, uh, how it functions, uh, power politics. So power politics is about uh, power maximization for survival and security. So that's quite a basic understanding of uh, political uh, development in Cambodia. It's about power maximization for survival and security. So I think all the political groups uh, in Cambodia are doing that. I mean, a similar strategy. And um, with regards to the international sanctions, uh, historically, uh, it do not uh, produce uh, kind of concrete results as expected. So uh, it's more as a symbolic. Uh, let's say it's, uh, what happened in, in other countries in Southeast Asia, uh, including Myanmar. Uh, so far, the situation remains a very uh, kind of uh, chaotic and uh, uncertain there, even though uh, there's a severe international sanction on Myanmar. So we need to see politics as it is, not uh, as it should be. Okay, that's interestingly worded. So, so Paul, it's, it's about survival and security. We need to see how Cambodia is and not how it would or could be. Is that fair? Is there a specific context to Cambodia that isn't being taken into consideration by the opposition and by foreign critics in particular? Well, I think there's, there's specific context in the sense that Cambodia is a country that uh, went through a genocide, uh, lost a quarter of its population, including my father and a brother. Um, and so it, the international community does have a special responsibility to Cambodia. And it isn't simply to allow might makes right in the sense of uh, power politics, right? It isn't to simply say that whoever holds the guns should continue to do whatever it is they're doing, because we've seen what happens when that was allowed. And uh, it's so important in the sense of uh, setting uh, the right message for Cambodia that, that, in fact, the investment of the international community in a country of 
currently 17 million people in terms of billions of dollars in foreign aid, in UN peacekeeping, uh, in uh, terms of troops uh, on the ground, that they should not have done all of that effort for nothing. Uh, there was an expectation that um, not only would there be peace in Cambodia, but that there would also be some semblance of democracy. And what we've seen instead is, sure, um, there hasn't been mass atrocity crimes, but that shouldn't be the standard by which we should judge Cambodia today in the sense of as long as you don't kill a quarter of the population, you can you can do whatever you want. Mm. If you could, though, um, help us understand better from from especially from an outsider's perspective. I mean, how present is the trauma of the Khmer Rouge still today? And how much of a card is it kind of to be played politically to keep that arguable fear among the population to give the, the this standard you've described uh, as as the standard itself today when people ignore the fact that maybe they don't have a choice at the polls I think it's ever present mm -hmm. I, in the sense that for most of the uh, adults at least my age who are in uh, closing in on 50 years of age or above uh, we've lived through the trauma we've um, survived it and so the messaging is always going to be that unless you do as you're told you're not going you, you, we might return to the period of Pol Pot right and that's obviously a very powerful thing to hold over people but the the positive side of all this is that young people don't have that they don't have necessarily that experience to hold them back and to uh, create fear in them uh, regarding change and regarding their aspirations for society, they're able to do the opposite of what George Santayana argued in terms mm. of those who uh, don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. They haven't necessarily lived history and therefore they can go a different direction, which is to say, they can say, hey, I, I think that our country should have more uh, equality and less uh, less inequality, fewer Bugatti Veyrons on the streets mm. while people are begging, right? So that's, they, they that's, don't think, have hope, that though. baggage. That's really interesting. Let me come back to Musukoa because okay. tell us if you think the actual inequality issues, you know, that in part led to the rise of, of the Khmer Rouge, have they been addressed over the decades? We know there have been economic, there has been remarkable economic growth even, but has the genuine inequality really changed? Because there are some pretty, uh, if I can say, shocking statistics actually out there. In fact, it now stands that, according to the Asian Development Bank, 1% controlling over 16% of the national income and about 10% controlling almost half the economy. Exactly. Uh, Hun Sen has five watches, and each watch are unique, is unique, and costs over $3 million for one watch. Yeah, just Hun Sen alone. His cronies, business cronies, his family members own most of the businesses, own most of the land of the people of Cambodia. The basic, the basic human rights is about land. It's about respect and dignity and the house and the shelter that you have over your head. If that is taken away from you by the rich, by those, the elite, this is all about the elites. It has to, and we don't know the real, the real unemployment rate in Cambodia because it's not given. We, and what, but we know is that over two million young people in Cambodia have, are now illegal or legal migrant workers in Thailand alone. Over two million, these are human resources of Cambodia. I want to also add that in Cambodia today, although the youth do not did not live through Pol Pot. Yes, but today they live in fear. It's the same kind of fear that my parents, who also died under Pol Pot, uh, lived under. The way are the people in Cambodia are terrified because the police can come to you at any time, arrest you anywhere inside your home in the middle of the night without any arrest warrant. Let alone if you are a member of the opposition party. So the the fact that we are not in the Khmer Rouge regime, that's but. It's true, but at the same time, we are going back to the year of the year of terror. 
I am am in exile not by choice. Mm. I am sentenced to 42 years in jail. And recently, my right to political activities have been taken away from me for me for 20 years. I have tried to go back to Cambodia to, to face this trial. If I am accused of being a terrorist or a, a traitor, let me go back and defend myself. I am not alone. Okay. The entire okay. population of Cambodia live in the, this weaponization of the justice system. That is not the Cambodia that we want. That is not the Cambodia that the youth of Cambodia want. They are. They want to. They have hopes. They, we have to keep up the inspiration, and we cannot. The international community cannot play the game of Hun Sen. Uh, he wants legitimacy. He, he cannot have it. Nor his mm. son. He, mm. Mr. Hun Manet is not the prime minister of. Cambodia. He is not. He does not come from free and fair elections. He is chosen by his father, but not by the people of Cambodia. That has to be clear. Okay, Van Aert, I'm, I'm wondering what you make of both of our last panelists' comments. And I mean, if you still truly believe that Hun Manet will be different, and does being educated in the West somehow give him? a different perspective? Or can you realistically, can the world realistically just expect more of the same, if not worse, as Musukoa believes? I would let the facts and the realities on the ground to explain uh, the next chapter of Cambodia. So uh, to what extent he could deliver in terms of reforms, uh, especially uh, public institution reforms, economic opportunities uh, to the people, so those are uh, the facts uh, that can uh, prove uh, uh, his uh, legitimacy. So we call it output legitimacy uh, that will define uh, his leadership. So I think it's still a bit too early to, uh, to say on, on those uh, reform outcomes, but I would suggest that we wait and see for, let's say, give him one more year, one year after uh, uh, getting uh, 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 to power and how he could deliver. So, Paul? No, I don't disagree. Not one more year, not one more day. Because he has stolen the hope the lit of the people of Cambodia. One more year would mean more forests of Cambodia destroyed, cut, and, and given to the rich. One more year would mean our women, our children will be further uh, be victims of human trafficking. One more year would mean poverty. One more year would mean our people in more debts. And one more year would mean Cambodia totally in the hands of China. That has to be clear. And Hun Manet has, cannot, he just cannot uh, get out of the shadow of his father. Look at it now. His father is not going away at all. And Hood Manet has had so many, many chances, even during the elections, to express his his inspiration, his vision for change for Cambodia. He has not. He, or to the contrary, he's said, he keeps on repeating that his duty is to his father, is to protect the legitimacy of his father. We have to take away this illusion that Hun Manet can change Cambodia, can establish reforms in Cambodia. This the, the okay. distraction by his father is way too deep. So oh. Hun Manet has the courage. He does not have the courage. Hun Manet does not have got the courage, nor the ability, nor the experience to bring Cambodia forward. We need free and fair elections and let the people of Cambodia choose down the people. To, they we're down to our very last few minutes. So, Paul, I mean, should they at least be given a year to try to prove that he can be an agent for change and move the country forward? Or... I'm, I'm interested in also what you think of what Tsukoa was saying about being beholden to China now, because the international relations are a key aspect to how Cambodia progresses in that sense. Yeah. Well, obviously, I don't, I don't know that we have a choice in the sense of it's sort of already under the control of, of, of or it's, it's been set on the table as August 22nd, um, uh, Hun Manet will, will, will be transitioned uh, to this uh, prime ministerial position. Uh, Hun Sen will become the president of the Senate and uh, will serve on the Supreme Court uh, or the Supreme Council of uh, whatnot. And so th there's, there's, while we can say 
this is not legitimate, this is not right, this shouldn't happen. Uh, at the same time, we will be able to see a year from now what he does do in terms of reform, if there are any reforms. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying that it's the right thing to do and to give him the, 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 the time to do all this, but we will, in the end, I think, be forced to observe what does happen. And that's obviously an opportunity to assess whether there are any kinds of reforms that do take place. Okay. I, on China, I, I think there's definitely a concern there as to the uh, closeness of that relationship. Uh, I don't think you can see any more daylight between China and Cambodia in these, in these times. Well, I'd like to be following up with all three of you uh, within the next year to see where all of this is going. And I'd like to thank all three of you really so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Unfortunately, we are completely out of time. So thanks to you and our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We will see you next time.